Imagine an alien signal traveling through space at the speed of light. A radio telescope picks up the signal. Astronomers check until they're absolutely sure it's the real thing. That morning people get to work, turn on their computers, click on to our newest mass medium, the internet. And then comes the news. Astronomers have made a mind-boggling discovery. We are not alone in the universe. There'll be a tremendous number of people trying to figure out all the information that we can from that signal. One of the big questions is, should we respond? Any civilization we contact will be much more advanced than we are. There are those who feel it will cause a planet-wide inferiority complex. There will be a percentage of people who will become distraught. These people might need a fair amount of support and help to get through the situation. And it could be important because we get information from advanced civilizations, clearly that would affect us. I mean, we might short circuit, you know, 100,000 years of human history and, and jump into the future thanks to the beneficence of these uh, uh, aliens who want to tell us stuff. I mean, that could happen. The differences between alien intelligence and humans is going to be vast, so vast that I think it fundamentally will change everything. Day and night, around the world, a determined band of scientists listens to the sky. In hope, they seek signals from other worlds, evidence of mysterious alien civilizations. They call their ambitious quest SETI, shorthand for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The novel Contact by the celebrated astronomer Carl Sagan is a fictional account of how the world would respond to the first confirmed message from outer space. Contact moved SETI from relative obscurity to front page news. Sagan based the book's central character in part on the real life Dr. Jill Tarter. She's a principal investigator at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. Tarter believes the search for extraterrestrial intelligence satisfies an ancient yearning. People really want to know, are we alone? I mean, that question is not something that we woke up two months ago and started asking. Humans have asked that question at least as long as recorded history. But now, there's something very different about right now today. And that's that for the first time ever, we actually now have the technology to try and do something to answer this old question. The question of alien life beyond Earth becomes urgent in the 19th century. Astronomer Percival Lowell is convinced that on the planet Mars, he has observed an elaborate system of artificially engineered canals. His accounts create a sensation. These were interpreted by Lowell as uh, made by intelligent beings to keep agriculture alive on a dying planet. So we have these uh, civil or agricultural engineers uh, on Mars trying to keep things going. Uh, these views became um, accepted by some people, scoffed at by others. Uh, but what the human reaction was in that case was to figure out how we ourselves could signal our presence to the Martians. The means to make contact seem to arrive with the discovery of electromagnetic radio waves. Nikola Tesla, an eccentric pioneer of electronics, built an enormous transmitter in Colorado and blasted radio static toward Mars. It was 150 feet tall, 
and was powered by one of his powerful transformers. And when he turned this thing on, people's hair stood on end for miles around. It was spectacular. He sent messages expecting a response, and he thought he got responses. Though convinced he was hearing Martian salutations in return, what Tesla really picked up were a natural phenomenon called whistlers, strange waves produced by electricity in the atmosphere. In 1920, the great Guillermo Marconi, inventor of the first successful radio, followed Tesla's example and pointed his own receiver at the red planet and heard absolutely nothing. Four years later, when Mars was in particularly close proximity to Earth, the United States Navy silenced all its radio transmitters in the Pacific for three days. They were still hoping, in vain, to detect a cosmic hello from Mars. Over the next 25 years, as telescopes became more sophisticated and precise, the belief in Martian civilization all but disappeared. The canals, it seems, aren't massive artificial irrigation ditches after all, but arid Grand Canyons. But at the same time, astronomers were realizing the staggering enormity of the universe. How many trillions of stars there are, the potential for planets revolving around them planets that just might support life. There were still those who believed that radio was the stepping stone to talking with the stars. Growing up in the 1930s on the Chicago South Shore, Frank Drake immersed himself in books that transported him to magical faraway places. When I was just a young boy, my parents told me there were other planets possibly like the Earth, and that fascinated me. I mean, are there creatures there? I mean, to my mind, my little boy's mind, my first image was, oh, yeah, it'll be humans, and the exact duplicates all over the place. What's that like? And of course, I quickly learned that was not likely the case. Surely the results of the detection of extraterrestrial signals are going to be one of the most exciting things that ever happened. In 1960, when Frank Drake, fresh out of graduate school, began the search for ET intelligence, he named his experiment Project Ozma, after the Oz books of his youth. His boyhood dreams led him to the emerging field of radio astronomy. Those days, we had an 85-foot radio telescope, a rather poor receiver, and we could monitor one radio channel at a time. Today, our systems are 100 trillion times more sensitive than in 1960. It's not wild speculation. We have the means to detect other worlds. Drake began listening for signals near the frequency of 1420 megahertz. At that wavelength, the element hydrogen emits a steady hiss. Radio astronomers use it to measure the distance between stars. Drake and others believe any advanced alien civilization will know the importance of hydrogen to radio astronomy and may use its universal frequency to send out a calling card to other worlds. Astrophysicist Seth Shostak is the scientist in charge of public programs at the SETI Institute in California. Radio is a very good way to send information around. I mean, the aliens are probably doing all sorts of stuff, but radio is cheap. In other words, for a dollar a word's worth of electricity, you can send messages from one star system to the other. We can do that. We can do that. They can certainly do that. Project Ozma ended without a peep from outer space, but it established Frank Drake as the godfather of SETI and encouraged others to join him in his quest for the holy grail of astronomy proof that other societies populate the universe. The Cold War rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States ignited a race between the two nations that sent astronauts and cosmonauts hurtling above and beyond the Earth. It also fueled new interest in alien life. After all, many reasoned, 
If we could take these first tentative steps into the cosmos, advanced civilizations might be able to accomplish even greater feats of interplanetary travel. The space race spurred fierce competition to be the first to receive a signal from another world. Within a few years, Soviet astronomers declared victory. Discovery of a steady signal that indicated a distant alien civilization. Strangely rhythmic radio transmissions, such as never heard before, were coming from a celestial body they designated CTA-102. Everyone's excitement proved premature. What the Russians actually had found was in fact coming from what's called a quasar. They weren't hearing a big hello from the heavens, but natural radio pulses from the nucleus of a young, faraway galaxy. Undaunted, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence plunged ahead. In 1967, British astronomers announced a precisely timed radio signal coming from four separate places in the sky. They dubbed them LGM-1 through 4. LGM stood for Little Green Men. Another false alarm. In truth, they had discovered pulsars, dying stars that naturally emit radio pulses. No little green men, but the search was adding constantly to our knowledge of the universe. Since Frank Drake's first experiments in the early 60s, SETI has become accepted by the scientific community as a legitimate and important part of the research landscape. More than 60 projects around the world have concentrated on picking up that first otherworldly signal. It's one of the few modern science experiments that just about everybody can understand. SETI is a fairly sophisticated endeavor. This is a hard thing to do, but everybody understands what it's about. It's very simple what it's about. We're simply trying to find out if there's anything intelligent out there. So it's an accessible kind of science. I think I've got the best job in the entire world. I mean, I learn something new every day on a huge range of different topics because there's almost nothing that doesn't bear on this question about the probability of life somewhere else in the universe. I certainly have a lot of colleagues who would not choose to do this job uh, because there's no guaranteed payoff. For a short time in the early 1990s, SETI received money from NASA, but a budget-slashing Congress voted to kill funding after only a year. Since then, Jill Tarter and most of the SETI scientists have relied on private donations. UWA-517, do you want to report a UFO? EWA-517, do you want to report a UFO? Over. Attention from Hollywood and the public's obsession with UFOs have helped in a lot of ways, but hurt in others. Many people think that what we do is of the same ilk, if you will, as the pseudoscience claims and the UFO claims, and they don't distinguish us. And that reduces our credibility and reduces our ability to get support and to get the respect we deserve. Although much of the public's interest has been fueled by our appetite for science fiction, the search for ET intelligence is real science. Recent discoveries in other areas of astronomy, as well as biology and physics, make the possibility of alien life more likely than ever before. If E.T. is out there, the odds are better than ever that we'll find him. In the vastness of outer space, we of Earth are reaching out, seeking confirmation that there are other worlds where civilizations live and thrive. It's a search that began small just four decades ago. Carl Sagan was one of the earliest and staunchest believers in the quest for ET intelligence. In 1961, Sagan was one of a group of scientists assembled by Dr. Frank Drake 
to develop a game plan to search for signs of intelligent life in the cosmos. To guide the discussion, Drake ingeniously devised a formula. Four decades later, it's still known as the Drake Equation, a sort of recipe for the probability of intelligent alien life. Those at SETI believe the Drake Equation may one day be considered as important as Einstein's E equals MC square. The Drake Equation is basically a fabulous way to organize our ignorance. It has no known answer. So it isn't an equation that you can calculate a believable answer. But it does really help us think about the probability of life being somewhere else. It may be a little scary looking, but it's actually rather simple. The Drake equation gives us a number, the n number of detectable civilizations in space, which we like to write with a large n. We arrive at that number by making use of the information we have about the evolution of our galaxy. The rest of the equation consists of a series of simple questions. The first term in the equation, which is r, essentially gives the total number of possible sites for life in the galaxy, the total number of stars. Now, we know that fairly accurately. It's on the order of maybe 400 billion stars. Uh, we know that by looking at other galaxies and just adding up the total amount of light coming from those things, and that tells you how many stars there are. It's really quite simple. With newer and better instruments, such as the Hubble Space Telescope, we're gazing beyond our solar system more clearly than ever before, seeing more and more star systems that are candidates for alien life. We now know that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on every single beach of our planet. And more are born each and every year. In the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, it seems there will never be a shortage of star systems to explore. The second term in the Drake equation, FP, is the fraction of stars that have planets. Until recently, there was no proof of planets outside the nine of our own solar system. But in 1995, two Swiss astronomers detected a strange wobble in a star, a wobble they determined was caused by the gravitational pull of an enormous planet orbiting close to the star. And in 1999, scientists found the first multiple planet system. It's orbiting Upsilon Andromedae, a star similar to our own sun. Since 1999, several more planets have been found around other stars. Harvard's Robert Noyes headed one of the teams that made the first discovery. We've surveyed, we and our colleagues, several hundred stars now to look for these planets, and about 3% seem to have these giant planets orbiting close into the stars. Very different from our own solar system, but they are genuine planets in orbit. The real implication of this is that planetary systems are common, and very likely ones that are pretty much like our own may well be common. The reason we haven't seen the ones that are just like our own yet is that they're pretty hard to see. When we are able to see such planets, we will have taken a step closer to learning the answer to the third term in Drake's equation. NE represents the number of planets that have Earth-like characteristics. Because it's assumed that life, as we know it, will need an Earth-like environment to thrive. Over the next several decades, the United States and other nations will be launching a new generation of space telescopes many far more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. One of them, dubbed the Terrestrial Planet Finder, will specifically seek planets like our own. And the long-term goal, say, in 40 years or so, is to actually be able to image an Earth-sized planet around another star out to a distance of about 40 light years. Now, it won't be a really good quality image. You'll be able to see things like continents and clouds and oceans, uh, certainly nothing like a spy satellite photo. But eventually, this type of capability, using very advanced telescopes, will tell us, in effect, where are the Earth-like planets? Where are the planets that look like they could harbor life or that may currently harbor life? That's the fourth term, FL, fraction of Earth-like worlds with life. Recent findings indicate that, here on planet Earth at least, 
life began at the very first possible opportunity. Life got started here in a cosmic eye blink. We have a cooling planetary surface in liquid water by about four billion years ago. And we've got life at 3.9 billion years. And maybe we can push it back farther. So it looks to me, from an astronomer's, not a biologist's point of view, that life was easy. Scientists know that organic hydrocarbons and even amino acids, the building blocks of life, are abundant in the universe. They've been found in meteorites, detected on comets, and in interstellar gas. The marvelous spark that turned these organic building blocks into life on Earth could have struck on at least one of the other 200 billion planets estimated in the Milky Way. What's more, our preconceived notions as to what's necessary for life are being challenged as never before. The last 20 years have had a remarkable advancement on understanding the conditions that are required for life. We see both in laboratory work and in field work that life can exist in remarkably hostile environments far beyond the normal conditions we see in the rooms around us. We find life at deep underwater volcanic vents, Field work by the biologists, field biologists have really expanded our understanding of where life can be found so that a few very basic principles seem to be required for life. One needs to have some basic elements, but these are all elements that exist in great abundance throughout the universe. With these discoveries and recent indications of water on Mars and Europa, a moon of Jupiter, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence takes on even greater urgency. If life can exist in extremes on Earth and in our solar system, the odds in favor of life across the galaxy take a giant leap forward. Frank Drake, founder and president of California's SETI Institute, has seen the equation named after him become the standard for anyone seriously searching for aliens. With a handful of letters and symbols, the Drake equation seeks to find the number of planets with intelligent life in our own Milky Way galaxy. Drake's painstaking objective research has silenced many of the naysayers. It's fair to say that in the astronomical community and in the scientific community at large, it's widely accepted that there's life in outer space, that there's life elsewhere. It seems more and more likely that the answer to the ancient question, are we alone, is a resounding no. The sticking point is whether that life extends beyond the microorganic to creatures intelligent enough to be able, or desire, to drop us a line. That's the next factor in the Drake equation. FI, the fraction of Earth-like planets that not only develop life, but intelligent life. All right, suppose you have, you know, billions of planets in the galaxy that have life. Now, what fraction of those are going to cook up intelligent life? 100,000. 1 million. And that's really a very contentious point, because uh, a lot of things could have happened here on Earth that would have led evolution in different directions than producing Homo sapiens. You know, if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out 65 million years ago in an accident involving an asteroid, you know, we wouldn't be here today, okay? So maybe there's a lot of real estate with life on it in the galaxy, and, but most of it is stupid life, and none of it's building radio transmitters. That's something we don't know. It's, it's not clear that evolution will frequently produce intelligent life. And if there is intelligent life out there, do they have the ability or even the desire to communicate. That's the next to last factor in the Drake equation, FC. Actually, I have a very, very pragmatic definition of intelligence. And that's the ability to build a transmitter. 
because that's the only kind of intelligence that I'm going to be able to find. Only a technology that does something to modify its environment in a way that we can sense over these vast distances um, is detectable. Talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but in truth, it's a search for extraterrestrial technology. There's a big catch, though, which forms the final factor in the Drake equation. Capital letter L stands for the longevity of an advanced civilization. Aliens on other planets may rise to a sophisticated level of technology, but that same technology and knowledge can threaten their total destruction. We've seen the potential here on Earth. If intelligent civilizations die off quickly, there's a good chance many have risen and then vanished. Because of the rule out there in the cosmos is, once you get technological, you get dead. You destroy your environment, or you destroy your world with your technology. Then there's no one out there for us to find. If, on the other hand, the rule is that ultimately, in the long run, technology is a stabilizing influence, then those civilizations which develop technology, in fact, may become quite long-lived. And then there's a chance that we'll find someone. Put them all together, and what do you get? A possible answer to the question symbolized by the letter N, the number of intelligent worlds in our Milky Way galaxy. When we've completed this multiplication, we then, in fact, have this thing we were after in the first place, which is the number of civilizations. And if we put all this together, uh, <clears throat> you will get 50,000 civilizations in our galaxy, a big number. That's a lot of cosmic neighbors. And maybe they have a taste for travel. For while astronomers continue sweeping the skies to see if we're not alone, there are many who believe, or who are ready to believe, that contact by now has been made. Aliens have come to call right here on Earth. morning in the future. This is what you might see over your first cup of coffee. I'm standing here in Washington, D.C., and I have to say this city is just buzzing about aliens. An hour ago, the House Technology Committee voted to upload the entire text of the so-called E.T. report. Now, that's a report that says a highly advanced extraterrestrial civilization has been contacted. To read the entire text of the E.T. report yourself, click the E.T. icon on your screen, now. Of course, this isn't real. None of it. Suppose, though, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, does turn up a galactic greeting, a radio message coming from a planet orbiting one of the half trillion stars in the Milky Way. There are going to be some people, of course, who are, are upset. They're, uh, there, there are going to be some groups that are claiming, you know, this is the apocalypse, and other groups that are saying this is our salvation, and so forth. Probably it wouldn't affect me too much. It's kind of, you know, it's one of those national things that, you know, kind of happens, but really won't, I don't think, affect my life too dramatically. I'd like to go on this ship and see space, and, and to see them as well, to see what they're like, and to meet with them, and to find out what they're about. I think there is life out there on another galaxy or another planet, somewhere, in some form. And I think if we contacted it, that would be really great. But you know, I think it would be very frightening because I think if we got a signal from someplace else or there was an alien being here and people discovered it was alien, it would frighten people. I wouldn't like it. I would be scared, I think. I would be astounded, I think. Upon receiving the word of contact, there doubtless will be a certain amount of I told you so from the various organizations, cults, and networks that support the claims of people who say they've seen or made contact with unidentified flying objects. Pop culture historians Jane and Michael Stern are convinced that this belief in UFOs and aliens on Earth 
provides entertainment and distraction from our dull daily lives. I think that people are really not that interested in real science because they don't understand it. I think UFOs or aliens are of the people. I mean, we made it up, so therefore we can blend it and mold it to anything we want. Just the notion of anything being out there in the universe that is not human is so much more exciting than um, finding a new hip replacement. Real science is boring, and UFOs and aliens is a lot of fun. Well, the point is that with UFOs and aliens, the sky is literally the limit. Aliens and UFOs are capable of anything, but it all gives us something to believe in beyond ourselves, which I think human beings always crave. We need to know beyond us. There's a very concrete precedent. Orson Welles had just directed the famous War of the Worlds radio broadcast, the dramatic show that frightened millions of Americans into believing the country actually was being invaded by monsters from Mars. It was Halloween night. Orson Welles created a radio program which mimicked a live reports from the field in which the reporters told people that uh, tubes had landed near Grover's Mill, New Jersey, that uh, Martians had emerged from the tubes, that they had uh, annihilated the uh, New Jersey uh, state militia, which was the uh, National Guard of the time. Uh, they were advancing on uh, New York City, and they were in the process of annihilating everything that came in their path. Many people were fooled by this, and indeed it caused a certain amount of, uh, of panic. War of the Worlds was 100% entertainment masquerading as news. When it was exposed as such, everyone thought this is one of the great hoaxes of the century. We now have maybe 95% entertainment masquerading as news. Uh, and the fact that we know that doesn't seem to make a difference. As part of a huge four-day celebration of the broadcast's 50th anniversary, the entertainer and mentalist known as the Amazing Kreskin was invited to give an outdoor demonstration of the power of suggestion. He selected a group of 70 people in the crowd. Without any kind of special effects or sleight of hand, using only his voice and mind, Kreskin was able to make them believe Martian spaceships had returned. I spied one of the subjects on stage. It was a lady in her 80s. And we saw her walk down the steps of the platform. I thought, oh my god, is she going to this UFO? She's hallucinating, no. We stopped it in time. She was about to, some 80 years old, grab out of the policeman's belt his revolver and was going to fire point blank at the alien she saw coming at her, which of course were not there. It was just crowds of people that were surrounding. As happened with the 1938 War of the Worlds broadcast, radio invites you to participate actively by supplying your own imaginary pictures to accompany what you're hearing. Like radio, the internet invites you to participate. Surfing the net can be a transfixing experience, pulling you in and leading some people to suspend their disbelief. Outside environment is closed off. There's no distractions around you. You have a bright light. It's almost like a hypnosis situation. A bright light, the light's dimmed around you. You're only thinking of one set of patterns. Now, interesting things will happen after that. It's very, very romantic to be able to narrow your attention into something, especially when that something does most of the work for you. This is a recreation of a real website. The announcement on it is fake. There have been hoaxes. It was a big internet hoax. Uh, in the fall of 1998 involving a star that we had looked at, E.Q. Pegasi, that I had written up for an internet site, actually, and uh, some fellow in uh, Britain, apparently, put on uh, his site that he had used a backyard uh, antenna and had found real signals coming from this thing. That was interesting, too, to find out how even stories that, if you look at them at, at all critically, don't hold up, still carry a certain amount of weight with a large fraction of the public.
There are sociologists and government officials who believe that the world has more to fear from paranoid reaction to the news of alien contact than we have to fear from aliens themselves. What you would find is a fair number of people uh, entering into advanced preparation, laying in food, their own water supply, uh, medical supplies, being armed, uh, figuring out how to uh, communicate with one another with all of the uh, uh, phone lines down and things. There will be a survivalist uh, kind of um, element. And what do you think the gun will do for you? Against the aliens? I don't know. But when humans find out we got food and water up here, well, I'm going to protect my family. And I don't trust the government that they can handle this problem. When the aliens come, it's going to be big. Do keep in mind that there's, there's no danger in, in, in picking up the signal. After all, I mean, if I pick up my favorite DJ on my car radio, I, I, I'm not worried that that DJ is going to, you know, jump into the front seat with me and start molesting me or anything like that. I mean, just picking up a signal is completely passive sort of effort, and uh, there, there's no danger there. Although so far there have been no fully documented close encounters, it's impossible to keep people from believing. Pop culture will trump hard science every time. Yet despite movie and TV fantasies, we have seen again and again that the greatest thing we have to fear is not them, but ourselves. Mass media continues to feed and exploit our unending appetite for both science fiction fantasy and the truth about the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, though, the scientists searching for intelligent life in the universe have become media savvy themselves. There's obviously a uh, really strong interest in the public in the question of whether there is extraterrestrial life. There's a lot of interest in, in the sort of uh, paranormal aspects of that. Like UFOs and crop circles and abductions. And what we're doing is giving people a chance to actually work on the scientific end of the problem. Dave Anderson and his colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, have enlisted the help of 500,000 volunteer private citizens around the world to help search the heavens for the ultimate hailing signal. They call it SETI at home. The idea is that if you have a really, really big computer job, it's going to take a lot of computer time. You can either make your computer faster, or you can divide the problem up into pieces that can run on different computers in parallel. It's kind of like having a, a lot of people working on one problem at the same time. We record the data at the world's largest telescope. And then we break it up into little pieces. Everybody gets a little piece of the sky and a small frequency band to analyze. These uh, small work units, we call them, these little chunks of work that we break up from uh, our data at the telescope, are sent over the internet to people with these screensaver programs. It takes a few days to analyze that data. And then when it's finished analyzing the data, the screensaver automatically sends us the results and gets a new piece of data to analyze. If SETI at home succeeds in picking up an alien wake-up call, some ordinary citizen somewhere in the world may be credited with the success. But if you really want to get involved, you can do what Mike Fox and Bob Lash have done, build a radio telescope all your own. The name of this uh, amateur radio telescope system is BAMBI, which is an acronym for Bob and Mike's big investment. Uh, and it certainly was a big investment for us. This is an ordinary eight and a half foot satellite antenna dish that normally would be used for satellite TV reception. What's different though is what happens once it gets inside the house. 
Uh, there we, we, have, we have no satellite uh, reception equipment at all. It's all entirely uh, designed for uh, SETI work. Right now in the average home you probably have more powerful computers than all of NASA combined during the moon landings. And so that gives us a huge advantage and with a very low cost. Anybody who has the technical skills and wants to replicate a system like ours could do it uh, probably in under $5,000. The SETI Institute in California plans its own project, Bambi, but on an enormous scale. For years, the Institute has relied on the kindness of radio astronomers around the world, borrowing telescope time whenever possible. Now they'll have one of their own, dedicated exclusively to SETI. Called the One Hector Telescope, it will incorporate between 500 and 1,000 dishes stretched across two and a half acres of Northern California's mountains to scan the sky 24 hours a day. Occasionally, we have gotten excited. Hasn't turned out to be the right thing, but it's enough of a taste so that um, it's gonna be a pretty amazing feeling for somebody someday when that happens. And there's champagne on ice. Everywhere we observe, there's champagne on ice. As time passes and conditions become more favorable for success, folks like Jill Tarter, Frank Drake, and Seth Shostak face a dilemma like the proverbial dog chasing a car. What happens when they catch it? What happens when they finally hear the signal that has eluded them for so long? All right, here's the scenario. We, we picked up this signal, and you, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of time to actually verify it. It's hard to estimate, but on the basis of signals that we've gotten that have had us fooled for a while, I suspect it would take a, on the order of one or two days for us to feel confident ourselves that this was the big one. So we have to get an independent group to see if they can verify it with a different telescope and um, a different set of software, different set of instruments and so on. If they can independently see this signal, there are ways to make sure it's coming from a long distance and check it out thoroughly. Then an announcement will be made. A highly advanced extraterrestrial civilization has been contacted. We are not alone in the universe. We've signed a voluntary protocol that was um, drafted by the International Academy of Astronautics and the International Institute of Space Law, which basically says, really check your data before you make an announcement. Don't cry wolf. But then as soon as you're sure, tell everybody. I'm standing here in Washington, D.C., and I have to say this city is just buzzing about aliens. If and when the epic news is revealed to the world, it's impossible to anticipate for sure how we will react. Now, that's a report that says a highly advanced... We can speculate, but the combination of wonder or woe, rapture or rage that will seize our civilization is ultimately unknowable. I don't trust the government that they can handle this problem. When the aliens come, it's going to be big. A lot of the public reaction to detecting a signal from life beyond Earth is going to depend on how readily we can understand what that signal is attempting to say. Now, it could be that there is a lot of information embedded in the signal. And that may take some time um, to extract from the signal and then having identified that there is some sort of a message. The difficult process of actually decoding it would begin. If uh, civilization is sending us a deliberate signal, 
it will be probably sent anti-cryptographically. That means it'll be easy to decode. It'll have language lessons, uh, lots of pictures. They will make it intentionally easy for us to understand the message. They might send their whole Library of Congress, all their music, their poetry, their literature, their science, their medicine. There, there could be uh, huge payoffs. And another civilization that's more advanced than us may be in contact with other civilizations, perhaps millions of civilizations in our galaxy. So by getting in contact with just one, we might learn about a whole galactic community of civilizations. We may get the URL to the galactic internet. The other possibility, and I think it's a more likely possibility personally, is that you won't understand it. It would be like, you know, uh, Australopithecus man, you know, picking up a, a, a television broadcast, a television signal. He's not going to understand it ever, ever. And we might be in that situation. I can imagine we get these bits and, uh, you know, people spending their lifetimes for hundreds of years <laughs> trying to figure out what these things mean and never succeeding. That, that could be the case. If such a signal is ever received, should we respond? In the United States, in principle, any radio amateur, any TV station, any, anybody can transmit a response. Of course, this has people worried that uh, somebody will uh, give a response which is embarrassing to us or provocative or aggressive or something like that. But right now, there is no international organization that has the license, so to speak, uh, to be in charge of what, any response. If these guys are, are a thousand light years away, uh, what's the hurry? I mean, you, at least you can deliberate this for a while, and it's been suggested that you should do that. You know, maybe get the United Nations together and have some message that represents all of humankind. Well, I mean, that sounds good. Who could argue with that? But, you know, as a practical matter, it isn't going to work that way. And to begin with, we've already sent our message into space. You know, I love Lucy, Mr. Ed. They're already out there, okay? I just can't imagine all humankind responding as one. That's not the way we operate, is it now? I mean, I, I suspect that anybody with the ability to build a transmitter and with a backyard antenna is going to try sending their own personal philosophies into space. We must also accept the possibility that the signal will not come in our lifetime, or our children's, or ever. Yet there's a well-known saying in the world of searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. They may not be very interested in us. If they're very advanced, we may look like ants to them, and they've probably seen a lot of primitive civilizations like us, and they probably just say, you know, well, that's the million civilization that's developing, and they're going to wait a little while until we get a little more interesting. Carl Sagan, the scientist who captivated Americans with the wonders of astronomy, believed the search for ET intelligence was important, whether we ever locked onto a signal or not. If there's a plausible argument that there isn't anybody out there, bearing in mind that we can be wrong, we ought to keep looking, because the question is of the most supreme importance. It calibrates our place in the universe. It tells us who we are. And so uh, it is worthwhile trying to find other civilizations, uh, I would say, no matter what. Aliens may not exist. They may be ignoring us until we grow up. Or they may be quietly observing us. They may even be waving frantically to get our attention. And we haven't noticed. Yet. If we ever do make contact, we can be sure that our response and range of emotions will be as varied as humankind itself. Until that day, we must remain wary of hyperbole and hoaxes view all claims with healthy skepticism, yet at the same time, 
prepare ourselves for the most earth-shattering news in history. We truly are not alone.